Good morning, everyone. It's good to be back. We were away for a little less than a week, missed a Sunday and a Wednesday, and that felt very unusual for us. Um, But this morning, we want to look into the book of Ephesians together. I've got a small little illustration I want to give to you I've been thinking about all week. This particular Bible is a New King James Thomas Nelson heirloom calfskin Bible. doesn't mean much to you unless you're a Bible fanatic like I am. Uh, All that simply means is I can do this cool little foldy trick with the leather, and it feels amazing. And that's not the Word of God. That's just the leather itself, you know, making me feel a certain kind of way about this Bible. I love it. Uh, It is 10 years old this coming March, and it's uh, not aged poorly whatsoever. The binding's still strong. The leather is still nice and and flippy and flexible. And uh, I've actually got the the insert here at the beginning to Alan Hornbuckle from Melissa Hornbuckle, March 29th, 2010. And this was purchased at the lectureship in Memphis the year after I graduated So I was transitioning from the King James Version to the New King James Version, and now I'm basically using the ESV uh, pretty much exclusively when it comes to preaching and teaching, except for the fact that I knew I wanted to do something in Ephesians this morning, and I wanted to use the New King James because of Bible Bowl this year being the Pauline Epistles, using the New King James Version. And one of the most beautiful things about this Bible is I have written sermons in the margin, which is very, very small, of all of these books. And the Pauline epistles especially have little outlines and lines and highlights and all these things done in a very minimal way to not distract me, but to kind of help me lead my thoughts through. So I was trying to figure out what to preach in Ephesians, and as soon as I cracked this open again, after it's been almost a year since I've even looked at this thing, Then I saw, oh yeah, heavenly places is a theme in Ephesians mentioned five particular times, and here are all the verses, and here's how they connect, and here are my points. So, guess what you get to hear this morning? Heavenly places. And so I tell you all of that in a very long-winded way to say that, first of all, Bibles to me are a very special thing, not just because of the content, but because of the memories I have about them. I remember buying my wife this exact style of Bible the year I graduated the Memphis School of Preaching and making fun of her for using the New King James when the King James was obviously superior. And then one year goes by, and she buys me this because I admit that she's been right all along, which was a great day in our household because she she won that one very, very clearly. And so this always reminds me of her and that little smirk that she had when I, when I checked out with it. She goes, oh, a new King James, huh? I go, yeah, a new King James. I've, I'm finally willing to admit that maybe you were right. And so anyway, that's, that's a good memory. Bibles kind of have that for me. They, they spark an idea of, of that time when this certain thing happened. And translations are important. And the little notes that I made in a very minimal, clean way, they help me through And so just a small encouragement to you to make friends with your Bibles. If you've only got one, then you have a best friend that's with you through all the things that you go through in life. It should be with you you every time you go to worship. It's just a a friend that you make over time. It's a possession. It's it's not going to go on to eternity with us. But while we're here, it's a a great comfort to us. You hear about the relationship that a soldier has in combat with his rifle that kind of dynamic that they have, that this thing is your best friend, you have to keep it clean, you have to know how it works, it's going to save your life. Well, that's a physical life. How much more this piece of document that we have bound in leather that can help us go on with God for eternity, it's a special thing. So uh, don't, don't neglect it, don't forget about it. Kind of make your, your time with your Bible and, and make it a part of who you are, an extension of you. That's my only encouragement. Okay, now moving on to the book of Ephesians, where we should be the entire time. Ephesians, if you read this book, I've mentioned before, is kind of like a mini Romans, in the sense that the same kind of things are talked about in a very, very short way. 
the main point seems to be talking about how Christ is the head of the church. And if you forget that, you've missed the point of Ephesians. It's the entire thing, uh, theme here. In chapter 1, verse 22 and 23, for example, uh, and he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So the one who fills all in all, he is the head over his body, which is the church. And so how important is Christ to the church? Well, he's the head of it. He leads it. He directs it. He's the centerpiece, if you will, of the body, which is the body of Christ, which is the church. And so that's the main theme but there are little nuggets all the way throughout this book that kind of lead us down a mental thought pattern. And one phrase that pops out to me because it's mentioned five times in these short, uh, this short book is the idea of heavenly places. For example, Ephesians chapter 1 and, ver and verse 3 is the very first time we find this phrase uttered. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. It's a very complicated way to say it, I guess, but the idea of being blessed here is mentioned at least twice. That word blessed is a bit ambiguous. It's hard to really pin down what that Greek word means for blessed, or even the English, what it means to be blessed. Have a blessed day. I feel blessed. What does that mean? Does it mean that you kind of feel happy? Well, in some ways, like in the Beatitudes of Matthew chapter 5, blessed is the man who does this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are all these people. So they're happy, they're benefited, they are fulfilled. Some translations will put there instead of the word blessed. But here in this context, the emphasis is not really on the blessings per se because the blessings are a part of a package deal. If you look here again in verse 3, blessed be the God and Father, so praise be to him, I suppose, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, or given us this blessing, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, and then here's the key for us, in Christ. And so you might read that backwards and say, if you are in Christ, then in the heavenly places, you have all spiritual blessings in Christ, who has God and Father of the Lord, who's been praised for what he has done. So again, a bit, a bit difficult to read backward, but there's kind of the gist. Now for me, the emphasis is being in Christ, we have all spiritual blessings, but they are located somewhere very specific. Not only in Christ, but in these heavenly places. And you have the New King James or another modern translation. It, sometimes there are certain words that are italicized. And those italics, when they're kind of small and slanted, they show you that those words are not there in the original language. So they're kind of added to help the reader make sense of what's being said. And so for our phrase, heavenly places, that word places is in italics. So it shows us that the word heavenly there is the only Greek word that actually connects to our English translation of the New King James. So that helps us to better kind of simplify this passage in a more literal way. So let's read it one more time. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, blessing in the heavenly in Christ. So again, a bit more kind of redundant there for us. But I think the point is this. We look at all the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. They are in this world, therefore all mankind, but specifically for those who are in Christ, who are Christians, we have them also in these heavenly places, in the heavenlies, if you will, in the spiritual realm, you might say, to make it a bit more uh, easy for us to say off the top of our head. And so here's the point from this very first verse. If you are in Christ, if you want to know what is in the spiritual realm for you, the answer is all spiritual blessings. It's the very first thing mentioned here in the third verse of this book. So let's jump forward here a little bit more into chapter 1. Let's begin reading in verse 20 
and following. Which he worked, talking about God, in Christ when he, God, raised him, Christ, from the dead and seated him, Christ, at his, God's, right hand in the heavenly places. You with me? Verse 21. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this age or world, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him, Christ, to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So one more thing located in the heavenlies, if you will, or the spiritual realm is Christ, who was raised from the dead, who is now head over the church. So you might say, simplistically, the resurrected Christ. So what's in the spiritual realm for the Christian in Christ? All spiritual blessings. What's in heaven next to the right hand of the Father for us? The resurrected Christ. So these two things are connected here by that small phrase, in the heavenlies, or the heavenly places in the New King James. So we have this mentioned to us in other locations. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 19, for example, So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And this is really just a precursor to our location. We know that in our lifetime, in our world, our physical existence is going to mirror that of Christ, meaning we are going to live, we are going to die, we are going to be resurrected. In the same way that he was resurrected, we also will be too. In the same kind of spiritual body he had, or eternal body he had, when he came out of that tomb, we will also have for all eternity. Over in 1 John chapter 3, let's turn there together. This is an important one to know. The resurrection, or the so-called general resurrection, we might say for judgment, is a theme that to me wasn't really impressed upon me, or I didn't get it for a while. It was like three or four years into my Christian life that I realized, oh, wait, we die, and then we get resurrected later at some point, and then we go to heaven, we might say. And so here in 1 John chapter 3, let's begin reading in verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. And so John just writes there, what what a great thing it is to be able to be a child of God. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. So if we have trouble here, like Jesus did, that's probably a good sign. Verse 2, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. So we don't have a full understanding, even John didn't really, of what it means to be resurrected and be like Christ. But we know that when he appears, talking about Judgment Day, We shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And so in some way, it's kind of meant here metaphorically, I suppose, that we're going to be kind of like Christ because we're following after him, we're living like him, trying to to mold our behavior after his lifestyle and so on. But in a greater sense, the more you dig into the actual resurrection. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, for example, the celestial body that we're going to have, the spiritual body that we're going to attain is going to be like that of Jesus the Christ. And so we look at that location of the heavenly places. We see all spiritual blessings if we are in fact in Christ, and we see the resurrected Christ, a precursor to the body that we are going to have when it comes to us being somewhere forever. In a third way, we look over into Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. This is a little bit confusing because when you see that phrase, principalities and powers, I immediately think of government. 
I think of national and local government. I think about the idea that we have different people who are put in different offices, who have different areas of responsibility, and they are accountable to the higher up chain of command, and they give their regulations down to those below them to get things done. And there's kind of a, an order or a structure of how things get accomplished, ideally, we might say, kind of tongue-in-cheek. That's a government idea here in this, in this Greek word. But specifically and importantly in this context, there's that government structure, if you will, an ideal government structure in the heavenly places. And so that means in the spiritual realm. So what we're talking about here is not federal, state, local government. We're talking about heavenly government. And the agents that are in these certain offices are not human beings who were elected or placed there. These are angelic beings made by God for that purpose. Now, how much do we know about those details? Not much. <laughs> We have curiosity, we have commentaries, we have fairy tales, we have ideas, and we have guesses. But biblically, we don't know how the spiritual realm is governed per se. There is Michael, the archangel. So he's the angel over other angels. What is his job? I'd love to know. <laughs> That's not our business, apparently. And thankfully, we have enough to deal with here in this physical government, right? So... Looking at this text again, to the intent, talking about the gospel essentially, that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by or through the church to the heavenly government, angelic beings in these places. So the church is saying something to this spiritual government of angels about how great the wisdom of God is. If even we can figure out how great God is, how much more than they that live in the same spiritual realm as him, the spiritual realm, if you will. And so that's one passage that talks about the idea of what's in those heavenly places is a structure of leadership and governing by angelic messengers of God. And we have a role to play in showing the glory and wisdom of God to them in some way. Also, Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 10 through, 11, uh, 10 through 12, rather, same concept. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the enemy or the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, we're not in physical combat, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age or world, against spiritual hosts or armies, if you will, of wickedness in the heavenly places. So it would seem like when it comes to the spiritual realm, you've got God's side and you've got Satan's side, as the old antitype goes. So you've got the angels that are in the government for the Lord and those that rule this world or this age working for our enemy. Satan or the devil. And so we have this spiritual realm talked about being both kind of good and being bad. Over in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, for example, in verse 9 and following, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 9, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls, of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching water and what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that were to follow. So basically Peter is saying, the salvation that you have now, the folks that wrote the Old Testament, they were very curious about what all these things meant, and you now know what they mean. Verse 12, to them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering or serving the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven, things which angels desired to look into. That kind of gives me a little bit of more information, contextually, that the information that I present to you, the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
not only do I know it from the study and those who have taught me before, I present it to you, and there are some other people who are very curious about the gospel of Jesus Christ, but do not have a need for it. How many angels are there? An innumerable host, we're told. So, pretty good number. And they are very curious as to how this plan is going to save mankind from sin. They were always curious. It would seem, being outside of space and time, they had this curiosity. So they saw the Old Testament being written, and they were uh, curious, and they see it now being revealed in the first century and following, and they have an interest in that. So that's interesting, to say the very least. And also, talking about the idea of the other side, if you will, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, the same thing is mentioned. Paul writes, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but mighty before God to the casting down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that's exalted against knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Pretty strong language there from Paul. He's saying it's not just warfare in the physical sense. What we're doing is we are launching a siege campaign of slash and burn when it comes to the demonic powers that are in this world by the gospel of Jesus Christ. My very favorite passage talking about this kind of thing is in 2 Kings chapter 6. I want to read one verse and then we'll move on. We live in this world and we live on a timeline. We have the sun that rises in the morning generally and then we wake up and then we go do stuff and then we go to bed at night. The sun usually goes down. That's been going on for quite a while. We live day to day, one day at a time. But when you're outside of that realm, in the spiritual realm of God, there doesn't seem to be that kind of inconvenience of time that we get to experience. And so this passage is interesting to me because I have no idea what it means, really. So 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 17 In this context, you have Elisha, who is the guy who took over the job of the prophet of Israel for Elijah, who is now taken up to heaven. So Elisha is now training a bunch of young guys how to be prophets. We sometimes call it the school of the prophets for convenience sake. Uh, But basically, you've got this major prophet and then a bunch of smaller prophets around him who are causing problems for Syria, essentially. And Syria is not happy about this because the prophets are getting inside information from God about what they plan to do in the future. So that's going to be a problem for them, uh, tactically. And so you now have the Syrians that come to Elisha, and they surround the city where he is. And everyone's freaking out, to kind of make a long story short, except for Elisha. Because he sees something that gives him great comfort... And I don't really know what it is. So 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 17. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. Talking about the servant that he has at his side who's freaking out. He says, Lord, let him see what I see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, The mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now, it just moves on from that to say, well, now that he kind of led him out from that location after he blinded the Syrians. But this, to me, seems to indicate that the horses and chariots of fire that were around Elisha were not the same of the Syrian army that surrounded them, but there was kind of a protective ring of an army from God that was there that was not going to allow Elisha to be taken captive by the Syrians. Of course, that did not happen here in the text, but he sees this, and that is comforting to him. And so, I don't know what that means, beyond the fact that it shows us that there's a lot more going on around us than we can see or perceive. And so, when I'm told by Paul that there is the heavenlies, or the spiritual realm that you can't see, you can't know is there unless God reveals it to you, 
he's now revealing what's in this location. He says, first of all, if you're in Christ, you should know in the spiritual realm, you have all the blessings that you need and you should praise God for it. That's verse 3. Secondly, if you know that you're here in this context, in the spiritual realm, Christ is with you and you're going to be with him who's at the right hand of the Father in a spiritual sense. You should also know there are governments watching you, good and bad. And they're not only curious, but you have a great responsibility of being able to know that there is more than meets the eye when it comes to your decision-making process, your decisions in life, and the eternal realm. And finally, let's move on to chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. Ephesians chapter 2, 5 and 6. Paul writes this, Even when we were dead in sin, or in trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to notice, after the very first clause here in verse 5, everything after that is past tense, meaning we were dead in trespasses and sins, and then something else happened in the past at one point in time that is now true today and forever, we might say. That's the meaning of the Greek here. He raised us up, past tense, together, and made, past tense, us sit together in the spiritual realm, the heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. What this means is that our spiritual location is not here on earth. Our residency, our citizenship is not here. We're just traveling through where our true location is, and that's with Christ. If we look over in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12, for example, another great Bible bowl book for those that are curious. Colossians 2.12, having been buried with him in baptism, past tense, wherein you were also raised, past tense, with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. So when we were baptized into Christ, our citizenship was transferred from dead in this world to alive together with him in the spiritual realm. Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2, If then you were raised, past tense, together with Christ, seek, present tense, the things that are above, where Christ is, seated on the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on the things that are here upon the earth. And so again, if we know that our true spiritual location is in Christ, we know where he is and where we're going, that should be our focus. And then finally, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's just one theme of Ephesians. That phrase, the heavenly places, used five times by Paul and Paul alone, only here in this book, talking about what we see in the spiritual realm if we are in the body of Christ, over which Christ is the head. All spiritual blessings, the risen Christ at the right hand of God, principalities and powers, both good and evil, and finally, our own selves, purchased by the blood of the Lamb, is currently in Christ, and we know where he is in the spiritual realm. The question is, do we live that way? Do we live with the knowledge that there is a spiritual realm, knowing that there is more than meets the eye, to know that we don't belong in this physical world, but we're longing for the day for that union between the physical, eternal body that we're going to achieve and the spiritual reality of what's just beyond the veil of this current life. If we can help you this morning in any kind of way by putting on Christ in baptism to begin your new spiritual life, or if you are a Christian but you have forgotten that there is 
that barrier between us and the spiritual, but that barrier is going to be brought crashing down by the revelation of Jesus Christ in the future. Let's pray for you to restore you back to the, the one true body of Jesus Christ over which he is the sole head. If we can help you at all, respond by coming forward now as we stand and we sing.